Good evening, it's Tim Pullen coming to you again from the Parsonage at Lakeview Church of the Nazarene in Waynesville, North Carolina. Hope you've had a good day so far and hope you're experiencing the presence of God and His peace in your life as we come together tonight to look into His Word and to hear more from Dr. Busick about the way, the truth, the life, Jesus, and discipleship as a journey of grace. Uh, would you join me in prayer as we come together tonight? Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all that he's done for us. Thank you for the fact that his work has opened the way for us to have a right relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you will be with us tonight as we dig into your word and that you will help us to understand our relationship to you better than we ever have before. And help us, Lord, if we have not uh, come to that place of putting our faith in you for salvation, that perhaps tonight just might be the night that we do that. Have your way in everything that is done and said here and be glorified in our thoughts and in our words and in our prayers and may Jesus be lifted up, that all may be drawn to him. In his name we pray, amen and amen. Well, I'd like to start off by asking a question. Which sin is the worst sin of all? Well, I'll just tell you right away, it's a trick question. The answer is, all sin is equal in that it separates us from God and from others. Another question is, which sin is the most destructive? Once again, it's a trick question, because all unconfessed sin leads to everlasting destruction in the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Although different sins have different levels of destruction in the physical world, they all result in our spiritual death and separation from God forever. But is there such a thing as unpremeditated sin or unplanned sin? Well, the answer to that question depends a little bit, in fact, it depends a lot, on what your definition of sin is. If you define sin as any aberration or from absolute perfection of thought and intention and performance, well, then obviously there must be hundreds of sins that each and every one of us commits every day with or without realizing it. But if you define sin as an intentional conscious act of disobedience to God's known desire or will, then you have to say that one cannot sin without knowing that they're doing so. John Wesley actually talked about two different kinds or categories of sin, one which he called culpable or guilty sin, which is the second kind that I just described, and one which he called non-culpable or non-guilty sin, which is closer to the first kind. He included in the non-culpable category those sins which we commit through ignorance. We simply didn't realize what we were doing or that it was wrong. Or through human frailty. Uh, we have limited strength. We have limited knowledge. We have limited experience, limited wisdom. And as a result of that, sometimes things are not going to come out the way we intended them. And sometimes even our intentions might be skewed in ways that we're not even aware of. So John Wesley would have said that all of these types of sins, these non-culpable or non-guilty sins, are covered by the same kind of grace that covers infants before they reach the age of accountability and those who are mentally incompetent. However, the culpable sins God does hold us account accountable for because we knew what we were doing and we either did something we should not have done or we did not do something that we knew we should have done. And as a result of that, we have disobeyed willfully, knowingly, and that requires repentance, confession, repentance, and forgiveness in order for it to be removed as a barrier to our relationship with God. As Dr. David A. Busick reminds us in his book, Way, Truth, Life, Discipleship is a Journey of Grace, the Greek word used for sin in the Bible is hamartia, 
which means simply missing the mark. The Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Roman believers, all have sinned, using the word hamartia, or missed the mark, and fallen short of God's glory. In Romans 3, 21 and following, we read, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation or substitutionary sacrifice by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. I often compare hamartia to someone trying to shoot an arrow at a target that's too far away. Assuming that we want to achieve the perfection of God's holiness, our bow is simply just not strong enough to help us reach that target on our own. Dr. Busick begins this chapter with a story about when world-famous golfer Jack Nicklaus was asked what was the mistake that most amateur golfers make. He said it was overconfidence, in short, thinking that they can make shots that they just can't make. Now our dilemma of being unable to achieve the holiness of God that he requires, combined with this rookie mistake of thinking we can do it on our own, are spiritually a fatal combination. Busick shares that according to a Gallup poll taken back in 2004, even back then, 77% of those surveyed believed that they stood a good or excellent chance of making it into heaven. What Dr. Busick said disturbs him the most is that many of the people surveyed affirmed that, they, that there is a heaven where people who have led good lives are eternally rewarded. Busick calls this led good lives mentality moralism. It's the false perception that we can ever be good enough in this life to be worthy of existing eternally in the presence of the divine creator of the universe. As Paul wrote to Titus, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In this brief four or five verses in Titus, we have the gospel encapsulated right there. We started off evil, but God through his grace did for us what we could not do for ourselves, pouring out by his mercy on us and by his grace the washing and the regeneration and renewal of our spirits through his Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, we have become heirs. Heirs. In other words, we're family members. In fact, we are part of the, we're, we're written into the family will of God so that we benefit from all of the benefits and all of the, the power and, and strength and wisdom that belongs to him. So how do we get from where we are to where we can be with God forever for all eternity. As Paul said in this passage, it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by his mercy. Mercy. That's a big word that we don't really hear used an awful lot these days, and, and even worse, we don't see a lot of mercy being demonstrated these days. But you have to remember, Jesus said in his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the merciful, 
for they shall obtain mercy. God wants us to be merciful. He wants us to be merciful and he wants to extend his mercy to us. But mercy is a missing element in today's culture. At the very least, it's used very selectively. It's amazing how we can overlook some blatant and sins and aberrations from the holiness of God on one hand, and then watch as someone is ripped apart for a relatively minor indiscretion that happened a dozen years ago or more. It's very selective outrage that I believe is being used to push an agenda of sorts, but that's another discussion for another time. But looking around, one can hardly deny that in this post-COVID world, perhaps because we spent too much time away from other people in social situations, there's a harshness, a lack of civility, a lack of tolerance for the opposite opinions, short, a short fusedness, a volatility akin to nitroglycerin in the way people interact with one another anymore in public. And often in private or on a computer screen. One never knows anymore what it will take to set another person off on a rampage of verbal and sometimes even physical abuse. And in the process, lives and reputations, sometimes bodies and property are being destroyed, all because of a lack of mercy. But what is mercy? One way to think of mercy is uh, in relationship to grace is grace is God not giving us what we deserve. In other words, we deserve punishment, we deserve judgment, but the grace of God restrains that judgment and holds it back. Mercy, on the other hand, is God giving us what we do not deserve. It is him doing something for us that we can't do for ourselves, and it's something we have not earned and can never purchase. Grace is the unconditional love of God in action which stays God's judgment, which we rightfully deserve, while mercy is the undeserved love of God which opens up God's hand of blessing, which again we do not deserve. In both cases, we don't deserve it. All of this is made possible through the atonement which God himself provided in Jesus Christ. Dr. Busick says atonement can be broken down to at one meant. In other words, we are made one with God as a result of the work that God did through Jesus on the cross. For dozens of generations, innocent lambs were offered up in sacrifice to atone for the sins of the people. This was done at God's direction as a temporary remedy for the sickness called sin in the lives of his chosen people. But as Paul wrote to the Galatian believers in uh, chapter 4, beginning at verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, or Daddy. So you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. But all of this happened because of Jesus, because God sent forth his Son, born of a woman. That's Jesus. The Apostle John wrote in his gospel, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Jesus provided this grace for us. By dying a death he did not deserve. A criminal's death, the worst form of execution ever devised by man. Crucifixion was a torturous death, often lasting for days. So horrifying that from that word, crucifixion, we actually get the English word excruciating. But as heinous a death as it was, this death, Jesus' death, actually served God's purpose. And that took what was otherwise a tragedy of a human being, a life like Jesus, who did so much good, ending in a senseless, murderous death, and took that and turned it into the greatest source of hope the world has ever known. Paul wrote to the Corinthian Christians in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-11, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom, at the time of Paul's writing, were still alive, though some, he said, have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. And in his second existing letter to the Corinthians, he wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him who to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Paul declared that he was what he was, that is, an ambassador, an apostle of the Lord, by grace made available to him through Christ. By his death on the cross, Jesus has made the grace of God available to anyone who will believe in him. In his letter to the Roman Christians, in chapter 5, Paul wrote in verse 6 and following, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, for one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for, for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, 
we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will the, those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through one man Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, the purpose of Jesus' death was our salvation. The thing that took the horror of the cross and turned it into the gospel, which means good news, was the purpose for which he died. Jesus didn't die for his own sins. He didn't have any sins to die for. But he was put to death as if he was a common criminal. So God took that sinless death and used it to pay the penalty for all the sins, for all humanity, for all time. And that was the purpose, our salvation, that resulted from his death. But we keep talking about salvation. What do we need to be saved from? Busick describes sin using several words. He uses the words rebellion and enslavement and estrangement to describe sin and its effects. You see, sin is not just an act. It is an attitude. It is an act resulting from an attitude. And that attitude is rebellion. To put it simply, we want what we want and we want it now we want it how we want it we don't care if god says that we cannot have it we are determined to have it and so we're going to get it that's rebellion you see there's a there's a huge difference between freedom and lawlessness in the garden adam and eve were free they had the freedom to eat from any tree in the garden they were only forbidden from eating from the one tree in the middle of the garden that was God had reserved for himself. They still had freedom, however. They had the freedom to choose to go ahead and disobey. But with that freedom and the exercise of that freedom came responsibility and consequences. Some in our age would have you think that freedom and lawlessness are one and the same that to say that anyone who can, cannot be who they are is tyranny and slavery. But what if who they are is a thief or a murderer or a rapist? If we leave them free to be who they are, someone else is going to suffer and perhaps even die. How can that be considered freedom? It's not freedom. It's anarchy. The Jews have long had an expression that there is no freedom without the law. And it's true that the law prevents people from stealing and raping and murdering and driving 200 miles an hour on the interstate. 
it restricts the freedoms of, of those who would otherwise do things they shouldn't do because they hurt other people, but they protect the vast majority of people from such evil doers. <coughs> and while we are not saved by good works, or even by obeying the laws that God gave us, we are saved for good works, which, as Paul wrote, God has prepared in advance for us to do, as he wrote to the Ephesian Christians in Ephesians 2.10. But rebellion is refusing to do the good works that God wants us to do, and often it's insisting on doing the, the bad works that we know he doesn't want us to do. But even though we think that rebellion leads to freedom, in the end it results in slavery. And that is because sin always has consequences. I've often said that sin will take you farther than you ever meant to go. It will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. And it will keep you there longer than you ever planned to stay. Sin always has consequences. And those consequences are almost always more costly and more long-lasting than the momentary pleasure that the sin brings. Promiscuity, for example, leads to STDs and unplanned pregnancies and broken hearts and broken relationships, broken marriages, broken homes, broken dreams, broken children, broken lives. The result of the reckless abuse of freedom becomes enslavement to the consequences of our own rebellious acts. The third result of sin is estrangement. Busick points out that in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God and rebelled against him by eating fruit that he had forbidden them to eat, they immediately became estranged from one another, realizing for the first time in their existence that they were naked and no longer able to trust one another. They hid themselves with makeshift clothes. Then they hid themselves from God when he came to walk with them in the garden as he normally did. You see, sin breaks relationships. It causes estrangement. And lost trust is a major factor in that brokenness. So what are we going to do to overcome our rebellion, our enslavement, and our estrangement? Well, that's where the good news comes into play. Because, as Paul said in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. He made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us so that in him we might be the righteousness of God. Notice, he didn't talk about doing righteousness, he talked about being. There's a transformation that takes place. We are no longer what we once were. We are something new. Even while we were still sinning, we are told in Romans 5.8, Christ died for us. And as John wrote in 1 John 4.10, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. God did the work for us. It was and is the atoning death of Jesus Christ that opens up the door for God's grace to extend to us today, to anyone and to everyone who truly confesses their sins, acknowledges that Jesus is God and that he died for all our sins and that God raised him from the dead who repents, that means to turn away from their sins and from their sinfulness, and asks for his forgiveness and receives his salvation. This enables us to walk and talk in open fellowship with the Lord so that we may continue to grow in knowledge and in love with the Lord. It is similar to when a couple decides to get married. They commit themselves to an exclusive relationship with each other, they each choose to give up certain things in order to grow closer to one another, to get on the same page with one another, to share their hopes and dreams and futures with one another, to determine that they are going to do whatever is necessary to keep and preserve this relationship. Saving grace enables us to enter into this relationship with God. He's already signed the deal with the blood of his own son, Jesus, and he has handed the pen to us. Thankfully, we do not have to sign in our own blood or in the blood of our own son. We, too, sign in the blood of Jesus. 
blood that God himself has provided. So from beginning to end, all is done by his grace. Grace is always, always, always the work of God. It is, by definition, God doing something for us that we cannot do for ourselves. Many times in my ministry, I've talked to people about coming to church so they can find the relationship that God has prepared for them. And many times I've had people respond to me saying, Oh, I will, preacher, but first I have to get my act together, or I've got to clean up my life, or words to that effect. And that totally misses the point. God has already done everything necessary to deal with whatever cleaning up or getting together needs to be done. All we have to do is claim it for ourselves. That's why it's called grace. I hope you've already experienced this saving grace of God, and if not, you can do so right now. All you have to do is pray this prayer from the bottom of your heart. Heavenly Father, I know that I've rebelled against you and gone my own way and done things the way I wanted to and not the way you wanted me to. I have this attitude of rebellion in my heart, and because of it, I have become a slave to my own desires and to the consequences of my own rebellion. I have been separated from you and from others because of my rebellion. I believe that you have provided a cure for my situation in Jesus, your Son, who died for my sins so that I can be forgiven, made clean and new, and so that I can become your very own child. I do not deserve it and never will, but I ask for your grace to extend to me. Wash me with the blood of your Son, Jesus, and make me clean and whole and new and take me into your family then by your grace help me to keep my relationship with you in good order in jesus name i pray amen i hope that you if you've never prayed that prayer before that you did pray it with me just now and that you meant every word of it if you have you may have already begun to experience that new relationship with God, a closeness with Him, a cleanness on the inside, uh, a sense of life being made new again. That's beautiful. That is wonderful. That's part of the good news that if a person is in Christ, they are no longer who they used to be. They are a new creation in Him. And I hope that describes you. And if you've prayed this prayer many, many years ago, it doesn't hurt to pray it again and to be reminded where we were when God found us and when we first experienced this saving grace. And it is a grace that changes everything if we'll let it. I hope you are enjoying and experiencing that grace even now. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the evening in the Lord. Take care. I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.